first, uh, just the electronic elements of the soundtrack. Tell me what your, uh, you know, how those came to be, who created them, and how did you decide yeah, to do Yeah, he was, he was on the faculty at Kent State. His name was Fred Colder, and he, he had done the music for uh, Akron, that electronic music, too. And so what I, I talked to him about was I gave him what I thought were the key elements to the film. And they were crowd sounds and traffic sounds and broken glass and rocket ships taking off to the moon and, you know, things like that. And he made the whole track from those. And he had never seen the film. He just did the soundtrack and then I put it where I wanted to put, you know, when he gave me the tapes back. And he always said he never knew what I was going to do with his music, <laughs> but he was so he was he was surprised and sometimes uh, pleased. Uh, other times not so much. But he just since I gave him the original stuff, you know, and he made it from that those basic sounds, then he didn't. I I just said, well, I'm going to use it where I want to use it throughout the film, and then I combined that with. Uh, the montage of radio and TV and, you know, just about everything and anything is all tied in together. And then you just mentioned that you had started shooting this prior to the shootings and then you, you continued after. And I'm curious what, in what ways did the shootings provoke changes in the film? What was the film you were making before the shootings? You're talking about the, the shootings, the Kent State. Yeah. It was just one more thing that was seemed to be going on and when I would be out uh, shooting people uh, or, or photographing people. Uh, I would just hide behind a sign and get cars stopping and just, you know, kind of innocent stuff of just average looking people doing various things with their hands and so on and so forth. And the funeral was just, it just happened along the way and I caught that and I, I liked the juxtaposition of the, of the cemetery with the industrial stuff behind it there's a guy unloading stuff in the truck and it just seemed like everything was was uh was being kind of death related and uh the me the way the media seemed to be taking over and the outside influences on me and just everything all around you know uh not only just the car but on tv sets and on radio you know that kind of stuff uh, so that became uh, pretty much an element of the film. What was the, sort of like the pastoral picnic by the waterfall, or however we'll call it, yeah. I think was that something that like preceded, or where was no, that? Oh, that was shot in, right in downtown Kent. It, there, there's a river, kind of the river, and there is a waterfall there. Uh, and I, I had seen that box at a, uh, at a museum, I think in Lima, Ohio, or somewhere, that was the uh, uh, <coughs> Noah's Ark thing. People, the doors opening up, and the couples coming out, and all the animals, that mechanical thing. And so I wanted to, uh, I wanted these people to be to walk around with this box that that would be inside of. I don't know if it comes off that way or not. And that was just a kind of a more of a pastoral thing of. of another time, you know, that seemed quieter and simpler and all that kind of stuff. I think that's all that I really wanted to do with that. Because there's something about the film, I don't know, for me, which seems like it's almost, it would be impossible to have such a film today, in a way. I mean, not technically, but it's just like the notion of, and <coughs> obviously there will, there will be exceptions, but it comes to me like everything and the kitchen sink in the pursuit of this view of both pursuit of art and a co political commentary in a way that people don't seem to generate films in, this, in that way anymore. They don't. You talk film. about audiences or, or filmmakers? Filmmakers. Filmmakers. Well, yeah. This is, the, the films that I've made, are, they were always a far cry from what everybody else was doing in uh, you know, the 70s and 80s, and uh, I just kind of went with what I wanted to do and how I felt about imagery, and uh, sometimes I just got caught up in the color of the film, and then when I edited it, going from one 
kind of a gray blue to a darker blue and then another person's face or something along the way so that became a whole different kind of uh, relationship tops of buildings and signs and superimposing things in other things uh, just seemed to be very much like the soundtrack itself a kind of an overlapping and, and, and kind of a uh, a lot of stuff coming at you all the time, which is what it seemed to me at the time, the way things were. Uh, and now I think they still are. I don't know if it's any different 40 years later. But I think we've gotten sort of used to it, and traffic jams don't bother us as much, and uh, people are into it. Other filmmakers are doing other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. so, you know. what, what was your sort of overarching approach to your montage for this film? Mostly just giving it somewhat of a narrative style with the guy in the car, you know, just kind of moving through the whole thing and things happen to him and he's just sort of this hapless, helpless character who sees things but doesn't really respond to them and hears things and doesn't really respond to them too much. Much in the same way that I sort of felt in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, Did you feel you were, you were an observer and a watcher rather than a doer? Yeah, pretty much so, and kind of a uh, acted upon rather than acting, you know, not much choice in the matter of what was going on politically or uh, uh, or even artistically, you know. Uh. Well, so let's see if there's any questions from any of you, please. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was wondering at what point you started working with the sound. How far, if you had cut picture and then started sound, or what your process was? I pretty much put the entire film together before I worked on the sound at all. Mm -hmm. I had everything, uh, which is always hard to talk about because there are some there are some sync things in the film, but I knew who they were and what they were going to say, so I didn't have to have it in the work print, you know. And I kind of had an idea of the of the. Uh, uh, this is kind of a uh, humming that would go through the thing. There was a kind of a combination of the traffic. And then the moon stuff began to take over, too. Uh, the black guy at the beginning, Cyrus, he was a preacher in Cleveland. I just happened to bump into him along the street. And he started talking about uh, as soon as man go, goes above the height of the clouds, we're doomed to destruction. And I, I kind of liked the idea of using the rocket ships taking off and leaving the earth. And that one scene of the old, the people on the water where they see there's fire and and uh, the moon shots going by. And there were other moon references throughout the whole film that I thought were kind of interesting. And I didn't exactly know where I wanted to go with it, but ju it just played a part of the film, you know, like like when we said, you know. And I still. Even now, I sort of am surprised that some, there's a little bit of Neil Young in there, here and there. And, uh, I, I had forgotten he goes back that far <laughs> to the 70s. Uh, and then, you know, everybody hates their own films, and I like parts of it, and I, don't, I would love to change other parts. And, uh, but I'm pretty much uh, sure that it was all put together before I really started in on any of the sun. It's interesting that you um, say that it's not a dream film, and it doesn't really have the conventions of dream films, and yet it all seems like it's completely from these characters, or in this character's mind. It's a mindscape that way. Yeah, I, well, last night, 3773 seems to be a much more of a dream film, probably just because it's in black and white, and it's kind of autobiographical as well as a dream. And maybe that's true of this one, but I think of this one as sort of outside the box a little bit, and, and it's uh, you know within this guy's mind and what he sees and what he what he remembers and what he sees, you know, all of that comes back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, what's real, what's not. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess in that sense, it is kind of a dream film. Thing. Yeah. 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 Y